welcome to worship. We begin our Savior's worship service today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue with our opening hymn, 198. into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead 
for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Jews. 
Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews were not persuaded. Becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of his brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason had harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king. Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they had received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving the command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Our second reading is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the promise, praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Heaven, 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Troubled and, 
and that agitated, then he gives us these words as preemptive medicine. We find such words recorded in the Gospel according to John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus spoke these words to his disciples when they were on top of the world. Just previous to this, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. He was at the height of his popularity during his whole three-year ministry. The disciples watched as he rode in triumph into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Then throughout that week, as the scribes and the Pharisees, the enemies of Jesus, tried to trip him up with their words, he was able to parry and uh, defend himself against every attack to the God to the point where they said, we're not even going to try this anymore. Then they were able to celebrate the Passover with Jesus where he instituted the Lord's Supper. And after that is where he spoke these words to his disciples. So maybe their hearts weren't completely troubled right at that very moment, but he knew they would be. Within a few hours they would see him arrested go through the trial, be mocked and ridiculed, tortured, and finally taken to the cross to be crucified. But then they would see him laid in the tomb and the stone put in front of it. Even after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension and Pentecost, their hearts would again be troubled as great persecution arose. Wherever they went, they found opposition to them because they were Christians. Every believer of Christ will run into times of a troubled heart because there is still sin in this world. There is still opposition to Christ. And so those who follow him will be persecuted. We also have from within our own sinful nature which causes doubt and worry and fear. While we're living here on this earth, we're strangers and pilgrims in a foreign land. We feel out of place at times because we are. We don't belong here permanently. We're just camping here until we reach our permanent home in heaven. Because of this, because of all the troubles that arise, there's times that we might feel orphaned. We might feel abandoned by our Savior when the going gets rough. And so if we incorrectly diagnose what is wrong with our heart and the troubles within, we will attempt to cure ourselves by following the strategies of this world, by trying to comfort ourselves with different assurances, by throwing ourselves into different pursuits in this world. And while they may temporarily or seemingly uh, bring us up out of our despondency, it's only short-lived. The elation is only going to be temporary. There's never going to be satisfaction for those who derive comfort and consolation from this life. The cure for feeling troubled, or one of the cures that Jesus presents, is the fact that he is preparing a place in heaven for you. He directs our gaze to the future, to the permanent home that we have in heaven. He continues on in verse 1 after saying, Not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So he directs our faith and our hope and our confidence to him alone. He emphasizes the fact that you are different because you are connected to him by faith. And your hope and your confidence is not in yourself. It's not in anybody or anything in this world, but rather by our belief in Jesus as the true Son of God, as the Messiah, 
that is proclaimed to us. This trust in God makes you realize that you have a great future, that he directs your gaze beyond the calendar, beyond earthly goals, to your true home in heaven. And he continues to boost up your confidence in verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. The word mansions, you may have also seen translated as rooms. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. That seems a little bit different. Uh, that word is a little difficult for us to translate. A little different than mansions. But the bottom line here is if you can remember that there is a place for you. That you have a reservation for heaven set aside for you specifically. Uh, you have your own space there that you, in which you can live forever. This makes clear the reason that you can be uncomfortable and troubled here on this earth. Because you're not home. When you have difficulties... And when things are there to cause a heart that might be troubled, the end result is that you don't look here, but rather look to the eternal. We understand for the body, when you have um, discomfort through surgery, through radiation or chemotherapy, maybe having a joint replaced, that there is an end goal that you're going to be able to feel better with that treatment. And so also Jesus uh, allows persecution and troubles to come into your life, whatever the case may be, not just so you would have this troubled heart, but that that would encourage you and lead you to look beyond this life to the goal of heaven. So let not your heart be troubled with the fact that Jesus is preparing a place in heaven for you. There are other times that our heart is troubled because we feel alone. We might think that Jesus has forgotten about us. We might look at ahead to Judgment Day and think of this great mass of humanity and worry that at that day Jesus is not going to say to you, come into the kingdom prepared for you, but that we might be forgotten. That maybe, in fact we would end up with the unbelievers, that we would not uh, have that uh, assurance of going to heaven, but we would go to that place of outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The devil likes to implant that seed of doubt, just as he did with Eve. Did God really say this? You know, is God really out for your best interests? And such doubt and worry is a tremendous tool of the devil to dislodge us from that confidence of faith that we have in Jesus. He uses that doubt as leverage. When we think of leverage here, think of if you had a big rock that you had to move that you could not lift up by yourself. Well, you could use a piece of wood, preferably a piece of steel, wedge that in between the rock and the ground and use it as a pry bar in order to move it. In the same way, the devil gets that wedge in us, between us and our Savior, with doubt or worry, even in the tiniest bit. He will want that seed to grow and to be able to pry us away from Jesus, to send us in a downward spiral of doubt and despair. The cure for this case, of this troubled heart, this particular agitation, is the reassurance that Jesus will not forget you. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So we see the world seemingly crumble before our very eyes and wonder, where is Jesus? Certainly this has to be the end times because of all the the rot that's going on and things apparently getting worse day by day. We wonder, where is Jesus? Has he forgotten about us? Has he forgotten about me? Why has he left me in this particular situation? But Jesus assures us that he wants you to be with him, that he is with you, not only in time, but he has prepared this place for you 
He's going to come again and complete what he started, that you would be there forever with him in heaven. He is working constantly to keep you in the faith. Not only is his word there in order that you might become Christians in the first place through the Spirit, but that you would be preserved in that faith. So everything that happens to you in your life, every road that he would lead you on, whether it's one that you want or not, is there in order to direct your attention to him, that to preserve you in the faith, that you would remember him. We do have that awful power to forget about him, but he promises that he will not forget about you. He knows you. He knows that you are his. He remembers you. He knows that the very number of hairs on your head. He knows your strengths and weaknesses. And he's working around the clock to see to it that you would remain in him. Because he had made this promise that he will come back and receive you unto himself. He says that where I am there you may be also. The key, the cure to a lonely and isolated heart is the promise of Jesus to take you to heaven. The heart can also be troubled when we feel lost. Listen to this dialogue between Jesus and Thomas. Uh, Jesus says in verse 4, And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? In a roundabout way, Thomas is asking the basic question that grips humanity. How do I go to heaven? How do I get to heaven? He's asking that thing when he's asking Jesus, how can we know the way? How can we know where you're going? How can we follow you? There's many answers to that question, but there's only correct, one correct one. Some of the wrong answers you'll find in various religions. In Islam, that way to paradise, is doing the, what Muhammad has prescribed, the different steps, and uh, finding a quicker route by being a suicide bomber. In Hinduism, there is the idea of karma and reincarnation, and you keep on coming back and back in this life in different forms until you can finally get it right. But those who believe in those uh, certain ways will never get to heaven. They'll never get to any kind of paradise without Jesus. Even in Christianity, the devil is working so that people will become lost by relying upon themselves. If they believe that there's Jesus plus my decision to embrace him. There's Jesus work plus my work in order to find perfection. Those are dangerous detours to be on. And those detours are going to cause a troubled heart. Because if we need to rely on ourselves, even in a very tiny way, then there's going to be doubt. That sense of bravado is going to be false because it comes right down to it. If we have to rely upon ourselves, there's going to be <coughs> doubt upon our salvation. Each one of us is too aware of our own imperfections. Jesus cures this particular troubled heart with these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Some people might look at that verse and say, well, that's entirely unfair. That's very exclusive. How can Jesus even say such a thing? That sounds very unloving. However, for the Christian, this is great confidence because it shows the love of the Father. Yes, there's only one way to heaven, Yes, it's only through Jesus, but he's chosen to reveal this mystery, this one way to heaven. He's freely shown it to you. And he shows it in a way that reveals it's by grace that yes, there's that way to heaven in Jesus, and it's free that Jesus has done entirely the work necessary. He's paid the price. He's given you the admission ticket into paradise. He cures your troubled heart by showing that you are not lost. You are on the route to heaven when your confidence and your faith is in Jesus alone. It's inevitable because
because of sin in this world, because of sin in your own heart, that you're going to become troubled. You're going to become agitated. Don't look inward for the cure. Don't look to earthly solutions for the cure. Look to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And your heart will be cured. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
God, Heavenly Father, you are mighty in power and infinite in majesty. We give you our great thanks that you sent your son Jesus to offer himself as a sacrifice for all the world upon the altar of his cross, through which we have been fully reconciled to you. We give you all honor and glory, for you have glorified your son Jesus by his resurrection from the dead, with the promise that we too shall rise to life eternal. Grant to us the fullest blessings of this great grace, both now and forever. Our praise to you, dear Lord, for you have transformed the short time of crucifixion, sadness, and defeat into the eternal joy and victory of the resurrection. Help us always to hold firmly to Christ's promise of eternal life, to receive it with joy and to live resurrection lives for your glory. We pray also that you would give your believers an inner zeal to do your will. Give the comfort of your promises to the sick, the sorrowful, the brokenhearted, and the anxious. Cast out from our hearts all fear of death and the unknown. Give us patience in every trial and trouble, and move our hearts to receive your many great blessings in love and gratitude. These things we ask in the glorious hope of an eternal day with you, and also in your name we join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Continue with our final hymn.
warm welcome to all in the name of Jesus, in particular any guests here today. Hope you can return again and worship with us. A couple of uh, calendar items that did not make it into the bulletin. Uh, this Wednesday is our quarterly voters meeting. It'll take place at 6.30, uh, May 2nd. <coughs> the following Wednesday will be our council meeting. Uh, following the service today, those who are interested in helping with Vacation Bible School are asked to meet uh, in the fellowship hall. We're going to talk about uh, the, a week that will work out as far as having it and uh, take a look at what uh, help we have to do that. Um, so we'll just congregate in there after the service. Um, seems like I'm missing something else. Is that all the announcements? Yes? Next Sunday is communion, which means there's fellowship hour, and there's nobody signed up yet. So if somebody would like to sign up and help set that up and clean it up, and also don't forget to bring treats next week. Okay, thanks, Jeff. If you couldn't hear all that, fellowship hour after communion service next Sunday. Uh, in the pre previous bulletin, there was Pastor Hannell's Han contact information, the letter that he wrote acknowledging that he accepted the call. He's back from vacation now, so if you have anything that you would like to tell him about our congregation or words of encouragement, uh, you can contact him uh, by phone or email on those addresses from the previous week's bulletin. Anything else? Yes? No? That's it. Uh, may God keep you in his grace throughout the week. <laughs>